Hello, Timmy Nafso here with the Embedded Podcast at Fortis. We are filming from Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay at the Electronic Transaction Association. Enjoy the series as we interview thought leaders about all things payments, the past, the present, and the future. Timmy Nafso here at ETA, Embedded, the podcast. We have Austin Talley joining us, founder and CEO of Everywhere. Um, welcome to the show. Hey, Timmy. Thanks for having me, man. Excited to be here. Of course, of course. Austin, founder and CEO. We love founders. I'm also a co-founder, so we love that. A leading contactless payments and customer engagement solutions company. You have over 20 years of experience as leadership and sales executive. Austin has a proven track record of building successful businesses across various stages from startups to turnarounds. Really exciting to see how did you get into the payment ecosystem, Austin? You know, it's a great question because, you know, not being a payments guy, um, you know, more or less, I always consider myself, you know, and I still do today, more or less a software engineer, you know, so developing software, you know, I would say that I was always about problem solving and developing software in a space like travel where I did not know it was high risk, but it's not like buying a cup of coffee, True. right? And it was all about de-risking credit card transactions. And one way to do that was really leveraging communication. So in the hotels, and if you ever stay at a hotel, you're seeing more and more text messages come across your device. So I was one of the originators, you know, call it 20 years ago, that was basically building the technology for some of the biggest hotels chains um, to really leverage text messaging as a way to help problem solve. And the cool thing about it was you can use bot technology or just basically a way to make it more personalized um, where the consumer or guest didn't even know it was a human or a bot talking with them. And it was through that experience really that led me to build out this payments company where today it's called Everywhere. Yeah, that's awesome. By the way, my family's from the hotel business. So you That's know. We grew up in the hotel business and I think the uh, audience may ha not have a full appreciation of what the risk of hotel payments are and what the weight of what you did, how it impacts hotels. I mean, you know, the idea that chargebacks could be, you know, conducted for 180 days after a guest stay and they can, you know, a lot of people are targets of fraud, especially hotels. That's really awesome to hear. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those spaces where even if you like, you know, pay for something well in advance, you know, nobody likes to give your money back, you know what I mean? And everyone has these refund policies and they try to abide by them. But at the end of the day, a consumer can just log onto their bank account, hit dispute on a transaction. Like you said, it could be months out yeah, or, or it could happen even months ago. And, you know, the consumer, for the most part, has a better chance of winning than the hotel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, they always are going to side with the consumer. And, and at that time, entering into the, the, uh, the payment space, so to speak, you now here are everywhere. What is it that everywhere really focuses on from a market perspective? Yeah, you know, I would say that, you know, prior to, you know, COVID, you know, in, in, in essence, because everywhere you know, today is known as a contactless payment solution, where I always felt it was about convenience. And I always felt that people, it's not that they don't want to pay their bills, it's just that if they were to make it more convenient where they didn't have to open up a piece of letter in a mail or log onto a portal site, that if they can just simply get a text message, you know, click it or better yet, just reply yes and the money move. Yeah. So it was through that convenience, you know, we felt that this could apply everywhere across all verticals and be more something that's a horizontal approach than somebody that's saying, okay, I can only use this for travel. Or I can only do this in healthcare. Yeah. I really wanted to build a company that truly, you know, could be everywhere and kind of hence the name. That's yeah. how I came up with it. Um, but ultimately, yeah, that's really what led me kind of into the payment ecosystem where these challenges that I saw in different verticals that we can really solve for. Yeah. So if you were to think it's been eight years, is that the correct? I would love timeline? to say it was eight years since we really were live, but it's really been about five, you know, because the first few years, you know, as a software engineer, I'm really building the technology, you know what I mean? And, you know, you, you get your, your corporation, you kind of get going. Um, but at the same time, I was also selling off my previous, you know, company. Okay. So I was going through this transition at the same time um, while I was building what I felt was the next part of my life, you know, the next chapter that we're all looking for. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, from an entrepreneurial perspective, there's a lot of risk that goes into starting a company. I would imagine that the first 
three years, two to three years, as you said, are the toughest, would you say, from, from a entrepreneurial perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's so tough that you really got to put yourself in the right area. And what I mean by that, at the time I'm living in South Florida, beautiful Delray Beach, and my wife at the time is a Floridian. So for her, you know, she has all our family here and I'm starting this new tech company, you know, going through this transition where she thinks we're cashing in and let alone, I'm only using this to actually cash back in and start this new venture, but better yet, I got to start this not in Florida. I got to start it in a tech city. I got to find somewhere that I can build a tech company in a city that really appreciates tech. And in South Florida, there's a city there uh, known for travelers or old people. So I try to raise money and I wouldn't even get my idea. You know what I mean? Before yeah. I would just hear like, oh, no, like you're in Boca Raton, Delray. Yeah. My grandma lives there. You know, great place to uh, vacation. But building tech, you should go to San Francisco or, you know, Palo Alto or New York. And I'm like, man, all those areas sound really good, but they're way too far. So we fell in love with Austin, Texas. Yeah. And Austin, and it was like a home run because I never thought nor thought, or even considered myself a Texan. No, Where truly today, there. I feel really proud to be one. It's really a great state. I lived in Dallas for several years. Yeah, so you know. Oh, it's amazing. It's a good, it's a good vibe, yep. you know, good energy, good people. Yeah. Big state. We actually, you know, being that we're from Detroit, our you know headquarters was Detroit. We're now actually shifting it over to our Plano office and growing yeah, our I presence there in Texas, which is really, you know, similar type story there. Um, so there we are, you know, you're three years in, you're building this. When you're in the technology building space, one of the issues that I would imagine is that the technology is moving faster than we can develop. What have you seen from those trends that you may have to have pivoted from where your expectation was X and it became Y during those days of building? Yeah, so right around the time where I moved my family to Austin, Texas, you know, call it 2018, we were able to close a round of funding um, in 2019. In 2019, it was right place, right time, recently closed around, and now COVID hits, right? Yes. So now COVID hits, what does it do? It really forces all these companies that were talking about going all digital, well, now they really had no choice. No choice. You know what I mean? So there was this digitalization that just happened so rapid, whereas now we felt we were building a convenient solution. The car networks like Visa and some of the other ones felt like, oh, this is a, an amazing contactless solution. Yes. You know what I mean? We should partner and we should you know, use it with, with auth.net or Cybersource or these gateways that really can leverage this type of technology and better yet, using a cell phone. And cell phone numbers really have a lot of identity behind the scenes. Sure. So being able to have a solution for the right moment in time, for us, that was like our rocket ship. That was our way that we started now really taking off. Whereas it would have taken probably another few years to reach the amount of scale that we were approaching um, in this short amount of time. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I was actually going to get to is like, was it two years of advancement, three years, four years because of the the COVID situation, silver lining, right? It was a terrible thing to happen. But terrible. for a lot of businesses, you actually just, you know, sped into the future of what contactless would look like, which by the way, we were already behind in the United States. It was, you know, you saw trends overseas. I went to Italy or I would go to different parts of the world and they're actually already in a contactless terminal environment. They're not taking my credit card and coming back with it. Right. I felt like the US and we've, you know, experienced this multiple times where the US is actually behind even though we're a first world country and we're supposed to be the most forward thinking country and we have all the best tech companies out there, but you know, we're also slow to adopt, you know what I mean? Consumer behavior um, is a tough challenge sometimes because you know, it was always like, oh, we can't go completely contactless because I'm not going to say, it, and, but essence, older people, different generations are never going to do it. Right. And that's what, that was like the mindset. If you're in healthcare, oh no, no, no. they're never going to pay with a text message coming to their phone. Oh no, no they're never going to want to use, tap to pay or tap their yeah. card anywhere or tap their device. But now you see how quickly every generation is taking advantage of a contactless payment solution. Absolutely. Nobody wants to have all these pieces of plastic in their wallet anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. And the contactless, contactless experience is actually tying to a larger embedded experience that I know everywhere is you know on the forefront of, right? It's, it's not, it's every aspect of embedding. If you talk a little bit about what embedded means to everywhere, into your yeah. Company. So for me, you know, I looked at it embedded as really not just even payments, but just in general, like the Internet of Things. Right. 
the adoption of technology that is almost embedded into everything that we do through our daily lives. And you're really seeing this transition that happened just a few years ago where cash almost became non-existent now, yeah. right? And better yet, I mean, you look at how many coins that are probably like left in jars or stacking up around your house because you know that you're not, let alone cash, I'm not carrying around change in my pocket anymore, no. right? So now there's an abundance of this, you know, that, you know, that was once upon a time the main payment source, but now I can go to an air pump to put air in my tire and I'm gonna tap the freaking air pump. Right. I'm gonna go to a vending machine to get some soda. I'm gonna tap the vending machine. Absolutely. You, you know what I mean? So whereas before I had to like wrinkle up a dollar out of my pocket, you know what I mean? To try to get it to go in a device. And that seems like, oh my God, I haven't done that in like five years. Oh, it, it, it feels so good. <laughs> I think, I think you know, it's funny because, you know, the fear of losing cash is a reality for a particular segment of the market. I mean, you know, it is harder to tip <laughs> in certain like little oh, situations. Oh, but now, yeah. You tip more, you want to put more on a credit card. Yeah, that's what's <laughs> happening. Now QR codes also are popping up and right? Venmoing and all these different Just experiences. Just when QR codes are going out of style, they're back. It's an amazing thing, isn't right? it? Like, and I think also COVID had, has something to do with that as well, that like, hey, look, don't touch the menu. Don't touch, you know. Right, expert. it was this monetization that happened almost overnight where everyone just immediately had to adopt a digital age or an embedded technology in some sort. And again, it's not all just payments. It's everything from all our devices that make our lives much easier. Absolutely. I mean, my coffee maker right now is on Wi-Fi. You know what I mean? Like, I don't get yeah. out of bed. I hit start. <laughs> yeah, it's a done deal. That's it. <laughs> you know I mean? You're a little bit low on your ink. All of a sudden, ink comes over right. to your house. Like, it's, exactly. it's really cool to see. I don't go to grocery stores either anymore. No. You know what I mean? it's, it's, by the I'm way, like, I'm pretty damn lazy, I think, right now. <laughs> <laughs> but but look, you know, we've, we've I've spoken about this in the past about people, when you look at like the thirties, the forties, the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, even, you know, it was very much a relationship based experience. And even payments were, um, treated differently at that time. You knew the, the, the butcher at the market, you knew the, the milk man bringing the milk and things were brought to your home. We're actually going back to that time of a relationship based experience. And that the payment is not as much of a conversation as it wasn't before because you had this relationship with this, put it on my tab. You know, I'll worry about it later. That was exactly. also part of that. So with that being said, now we're in this world of AI. Um, there's a lot of conversation here at ETA about AI. I think it's in everyone's, uh, you know, every speaker I've heard so far, you know yeah. what I mean, it was, it was in their topic. Yeah, one thing that I've been like reflecting on with AI, it's like, it's like saying you're a doctor. Right. And it's like, oh, you're a doctor. Uh, what's wrong with my foot? And it's like, well, no, I'm actually a dentist, a doctor in front of my name. And like, I only can work on your, your teeth here. But people hear doctor and they all of a sudden just make this assumption that it is all encompassing. That is the doctor. That's the medical field. So, right. so many specialties and so many different versions of medical health from chiropractic to physical therapy to internal, you know, I mean, there's all these, and I think the same for AI. So from your perspective of AI, how is it affecting the payment industry and the next three to five years? Besides using AI to like even write my script right now, because <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. I feel like we use it now in our daily lives. And I think everyone today, if you're not a doctor, then please download ChatGPT and you can be a doctor. Because, there you, go. you know what I mean? Because <laughs> exactly you can plug right. my, my symptoms in right now and I'll freaking diagnose you in yeah, zero totally. seconds. Yeah. Is yeah. that your favorite? Is that your go to ChatGPT right it now? It is. is right now, it's okay. definitely my favorite. Um, probably because I already pay for the year. There you, you know go. I mean? So yeah. maybe, I'll, maybe I'll test out another one. But um, but yeah, I mean, it writes my emails even. You know what I mean? So it's, my personal assistant doesn't really have much of a job anymore because of ChatGPT. That's amazing. Yeah. But, I, you know, I would just say that, you know, in AI and payments, like you said, it's such a big ecosystem in payments. How do we leverage this in all these different verticals where it makes sense? And again, the one thing that I found that makes sense about ChatGPT and how we see it in, in our product offering is that, you know, it doesn't have to be a voice enabled. So in other words, like um, you have so much patterns that are in your system for data. So in other words, like if you're a healthcare billing company, if I was to look under the hood at your data, I can know pretty much like a heartbeat of how people typically like to pay. 9 a.m. in the morning, you know what I mean? Based on how this diagnosis seems to pay more than the others, these people that have this a uh, potential issue with their life, uh, always kind of fall in these buckets. So my system and the way that I would build it with chat or even other AI components was, 
have a pattern recognition where it can actually act like a human and give you more personalized payment plans. In other words, like there's a lot of 1099 people that get employed out there. Absolutely. They get paid weekly, right? Yeah. So monthly payments don't work for them. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the month, it could be when they're always broke. But if exactly. you get me like on a weekly basis, man, like I will repay yeah. you on a weekly basis. Exactly. But if you don't have that type of flexibility built into your payment engine, then you're out. You know what I mean? You're going to collections. You're going to all. It causes a lot more. I would say people that are going to be like delinquent than really should be if you can only meet them where they're getting paid. Exactly right. Exactly right. I think that we're in the environment we're in due to the lack of technology. So you know, you know. Back years ago, it was easy at hard day's work. You'd pay somebody at the end of their hard day. The gig economy, essentially. And as you're mentioning about the 1099. So with that being said, the AI that we're experiencing here is going to make things more flexible. It's going to make it easier. What danger do you see coming out of AI from a technological perspective and a threat to our respective companies? Do you see any dangers? You know, I think what, what comes with technology, especially that advanced, is how scary it is that it's that advanced. You know what I mean? And being put in the wrong hands, is, which is really easy to do. I mean, because we all have access uh, to this technology today. It's not like, oh, we're blacklisting these individuals. You know what I mean? So, and the fraudsters are, seem to always kind of be one step ahead. Um, you know, so, you know, so there's always going to be that layer of, you know, call it fraud that's, that's out there. Um, whether we're seeing it today uh, with AI or it's being built as we speak. Yeah. Um, it's become so advanced that it can be in the wrong hands and you now use um, to actually do a lot more harm than good. In other words, like um, con people out of money, right? Which seems to be easier to do um, with, I would call it, smarter people in the sense like they you always have like a great salesperson this guy can sell me anything yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, i mean yeah. well what if that salesperson is ai and he's that freaking good yeah you yeah know what i mean you can't maybe, stop him right i mean and maybe it's a her you know what i yeah. mean that sounds really good yeah. on the phone and entices and in a way that basically winds up basically just constantly out there just you know scooping up you know as many you know you know call it people that are vulnerable you know what i mean yeah. that would basically easily hand over their credit card over a device or a phone or anything Absolutely. that would enable them to just put it into a website only for it to be like now stolen. Right? Yeah. Used for, so. Scary stuff for sure. But with everything that's exciting, there's always that downside risk. That's why risk departments are created. Exactly. <laughs> it does add jobs as well to, to, to manage right? that part of it. So for everywhere and the, and the future, are there particular initiatives that are like must for businesses? Like, so if you're talking to those businesses, you're talking to software, you're talking to the embedded kind of community and people are thinking about it. What is that must do or must have for today and the future? Now, it's a great question because as an entrepreneur, you know, you're always kind of thinking about the future of what's coming next. Yes, you're out there selling your product today, but you know, for me, I'm an engineer. I'm always thinking about what is around the corner that we could be solving for. So for me, I always look at it as like just how easy it is to go to an airport and go through the clear line or through the TSA line because of the convenience of that. We're right at the wait online. I believe that we're all going to want to be verified. And verify means like I'm willing to give up my identity in exchange for faster payment transactions, the ability to move a lot more money. Why? Because I am verified and it says yes. that, you know, and that's why I'm really so, you know, passionate about the cell phone number because the cell phone number if we have it in our system, we also behind the scenes have your social. And if we don't, that means you're already high risk. Because I don't know about you, I've had my cell phone now for 20 years. Yep. Same number for Same me. Same number, right? Yeah. I, I would maybe retire my number, you know what yeah, I mean, yeah. before I'm gonna like release it. Exactly. Because it has so much data tied to it. Absolutely. And I really believe that people are gonna wanna become verified where that they can also have cheaper interchange, better customer service. They know your customer is, it's not a guessing game. You know what I mean? So it just makes a lot of sense. And again, it goes back to that. I want that fast checkout experience yep. with the friction, with the least amount of friction. Exactly right. Exactly right. That is really good insight. It is a scary world we're going into, but it's also beautiful to see all of the evolution. Some people were like five years ago, yeah, the payment industry is not even going to exist in, you know, five years or it's going to be commoditized and gone. And we watch entrepreneurs, founders like yourself, 
continue to evolve and shift and change the landscape of payments. So I am excited to see what Everywhere is doing. I am excited to see um, what we're building together. I think it's, it's Absolutely. super cool to see. So uh, Austin, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks love for having the conversation, me, man. man. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, no, I love uh, I love talking about you know payments, man. It's like uh, it's like you know really at the the heart of what we do every day. So it's always exciting to get up here to uh, you know yeah. be able to brag about you know what we're uh, what we're doing and what yeah. we're launching. We got a, a stage uh, a session on stage two, which is cool to do. So yeah, I'm is, looking man. forward to it. Looking forward to that. <laughs> All right, my brother. Thank you. You got Thanks, it, Austin. If you want to learn about all things ETA and all of the interviews that we have hosted, please watch the podcast Embedded on Spotify, Apple. You can also find us on YouTube and all the social channels.